my worship, my worship, my worship, Lord, my worship. Sometimes my worship is all I have, Lord. I don't have much else, Lord. Just my worship. At the end of my road, my journey today, and what I'm going through, all I really have is my worship. And that it be continually in my mouth, that it may be my praise, my continuously be put forth, that Lord, you will accept it. But none, nothing else seems like it's working. Nothing else. I don't have much else to give. I don't. My portion doesn't feel like enough, but my worship, Lord, what I have to offer is my worship. The very words that you give me, Lord, the promises you give me, I give them back to you, Lord. That you will never leave or forsake me, O oh Father God. That is my worship. That is my worship. I have no eloquence of no, no vision of the future, no idea of what tomorrow holds. But today I have my worship, Lord. And so we worship you, O oh Father God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you in this moment, O oh Father God. We worship you. We know, O oh Father God, O oh Lord, that whatever besets us on each side, that, O oh Lord, you are still our God who is with us. And so we don't worship you because of what the things that we have, the substance that you give us. We worship you for who you are, Lord. Why don't we just worship the Lord? If you have hands, if you have a mouth, open your mouth. Just worship the Lord. Whatever you have today that's in you to worship, worship. Whatever it is, whatever you have, just give it to the Lord. This is an offering place, an altar, a fleshing floor. To offer your worship today, whatever it is that's distracting you, set it aside today, this moment, this hour. God wants his worship. He wants his worship. Let us worship. Let's worship. Let's worship. Let's give the Lord his praise and his worship. Your worship, Lord. Your worship, Lord. Your worship, Lord. You're worthy of it, Lord. You're owed it, Lord. You're due your worship, Lord. You're King of Kings and you're Lord of Lords. You're worthy. You're worthy, you're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. For all the praise, you're worthy, Father God. So we praise you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. We give you glory, oh Father God. You're worthy this moment. I know some have heavy hearts, and oh Father God, but we set it aside, oh Father, to just worship you. To give you what you do, oh Father, to give you your honor, to give you your praise, oh Father God. Oh, oh Lord, no matter what season it is, I will worship you. At all times, oh Father God, your praise will be continuously in my mouth. Father God, thank you. Would you give the Lord a hand clap? Uh, just these words. I know, listen, I'm not going to prod you today. I have everything to be thankful for. Uh, everything. I don't I've got a testimony. I'm going to preach, but... I don't know about you, but I just owe oh, God everything. I owe him everything. Praise God. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I'm not going to have you standing long. I'm not going to have you standing long. Just giving honor to Pastor Ross in her, um, in her absence. Reverend People, Reverend Murky, God bless you. Everyone in their perspective places. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time, isn't it? In His holy temple. Isn't it a good thing uh, that we should come to His house knowing that there is a word and a blessing for us? This is home base. I don't know what your week was like, but you're home now. Praise God. We're in the house of the Lord. Huh? It's good to be in the house of God one more time. While you're standing, let us look to the word, the gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. We're just going to read verses 1 through 8. The gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. When you have it, say amen. All right. And the word of the Lord says in St. Mark 9, beginning at 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you,
that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus take with him Peter and James and John and leaded them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his remnant became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Somebody say good. good. Oh, my. And let us make three tabernacles one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias and he was not what to say for they were sore afraid and there was a cloud someone say cloud that overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son hear him In verse 8 and suddenly when they had looked round about they saw no man anymore Save Jesus only with themselves. On your way to your seat, I'm just going to preach for a little while this morning on the topic of greatness must guide you. Greatness must guide you on your way to your seats. Let's pray. Father God, your help cometh today, Lord. There's no other help but which cometh from the Lord. My eyes are watching you like Jehoshaphat, king of old. I, I raise my head and we command the people to keep our eyes stayed on God. Be with us this moment, O oh Father. Teach what you must teach. Show what you must show. Reveal what you must reveal. To these your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let us say amen. amen. While seated in the house of the Lord, Greatness must be got must guide you. Greatness must. It must. Must is an imperative. Not that it should guide you or it can guide you. It must guide you. Greatness must guide you. Now greatness is to be differentiated from goodness. We all have a goodness about us. God is calling us to goodness, goodness of character and ethos, if I may. A way of life that is guided by the moral turpitude that Jesus represented. Somebody still with me? Yes. That goodness is the character, the fruit of Jesus Christ. The goodness about us. The only good thing about us, in other words, is the character of Christ working within us. That when the young man with substance said, good master to Jesus, he said, none is good except the Father. Saying that we all, in other words... Even Jesus being an example of God, yet in physical form, was saying that this world is full of so many examples of tribulation, trial, and challenge that we all have one star that is our character within us that is guiding us toward goodness. In other words, none of us are perfect, but we have within us principles given to us by Christ of how we ought to live and conduct our lives. That that becomes a way of life that is constantly being perfected in us. In other words, that we face our challenges with the character of Christ that is imploring us to be good. Somebody still listening. Now greatness though is a whole nother order. <laughs> that if we're called to be good all the time, we're called to be great sometimes. And the thing about greatness is, greatness doesn't show up every day. Ah, it doesn't show up every day. Every day will not require a level of commitment where you will get a crown, where you will get a trophy, where you will win the gold, where you will be the five star, where you will be on top. But greatness, never, nevertheless, it must guide you. The reason why greatness must guide you, regardless of whether you get some recognition for it today, is greatness requires that you always be prepared for when your moment comes. Always be prepared. Greatness is the hardest thing to achieve because it requires a lifestyle above goodness. Always waiting for the thing inside of you to be activated. In other words, goodness is all the time. But greatness is something 
everything that is supposed to be built up inside of you on top of your goodness just in case God calls you to do something great. Most of us can't handle greatness. We don't know what it's like to carry water and you don't need it today. We think it's a burden to have the substance that God is requiring of you in greatness when you don't need it every day and can't show it every day and won't demonstrate it every day and won't be rewarded for it every day. Greatness then becomes heavy to, for some folks, for every people. They don't want to carry it for just in case. I don't know about you, but I know there's firefighters and police officers and servicemen and women. They don't fight war every day. They don't fight fires every day. They're not locking up criminals every moment, but they're trained for excellence and greatness for when the moment comes that they need it, they can demonstrate the thing that makes it seem like the ordinary can then transform into the extraordinary. But the truth is that nothing supernatural is happening in the moment. They actually always had the training in them. The thing that they're required to do just comes out of them at the right moment in time. Somebody's listening. Greatness, greatness, greatness must guide you. We look at goodness. Some of us just struggle with goodness. It's hard enough. It's hard enough to stay out of the wrong bed. It's hard enough. To not curse people out. Come on, somebody. It's hard enough not, not to get activated in that old worldly way. That carnal mind. Somebody ain't been saved that long that you don't remember. What it's like to struggle with goodness in you. Having to sometimes remember what you were taught and understand what Jesus would do. That doesn't always surface. When you're in the drive-thru and somebody's behind you beeping at you to go faster, you're saying, wait a second, it's my time to order. Come on. Should I get out of this car? I see him in the rear view mirror. Huh? Yeah. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, but I have to let you know I sometimes struggle with my own goodness. I need references. I need to say Sometimes I have to call folks. I remember one time I was traveling and these guys offended me. I was in another country and I had to call one of my buddies. I said, wow, it's getting ready to get ugly in here. And I'm not, he said, you don't want to get locked up, Coltrane. Because I can't come and say, I don't even know the currency to pay to get you out. So you're going to have to hold that one. Come on. Goodness is hard enough. But the good thing about it is when we understand greatness on top of goodness, we know that our goodness is only protecting and holding and supporting and locking away and keeping safe our greatness for when we need it. So the real purpose of goodness is not for goodness sake. It's to hold and protect your greatness. That your goodness is a way of sustaining you for when you got to fight fires. And when you got to fight wars. And when you got to part seas, Moses. And when you have to speak to Pharaoh's need, Joseph. Goodness is a way of containing and creating context for your everyday living. So that you don't erode your life. Destroy your life. Mess up your life. Dump down your character so that you can maintain a type of stance, a type of mediated opportunity to every day look life in the face and say, does this deserve my goodness or do I need to kick it in high gear and give this moment my greatness? Goodness does that for you. Goodness does that for you. Those of us who are not walking in our goodness have no ability, are confused, are double-minded, are afraid to demonstrate greatness because there's no foundation from which to operate. God shows us here in the scripture in Mark, Jesus is in a very peculiar moment. He takes his most faithful 
people with him up onto the mountain. And so, we find in the scripture that this moment that Jesus is in in his life is a moment in the middle of his ministry where the Pharisees just a chapter before were questioning his credibility. He would argue and had been put in a position to justify his existence as the son of God. And so he's a little tired and frustrated from defending his goodness. And so Jesus takes three with him. The Bible says Peter, James, and John came with him up onto the mountain. And as the scriptures say here in Mark 9, 1 and 8, that Jesus is putting himself in a position where the light of, the, of heaven opens up and shines on him. There's a whiteness that cannot even be described is what the Bible says. And in that moment, out of the very firmament of heaven, the, the Bible says that the clouds opened up. Now, clouds are a very important thing in the Bible. The clouds represent this separation between what's natural and what's spiritual. I'm not going to get too deep, but I'm going to say this to you about clouds. That whenever the Bible talks about clouds, God is talking about greatness. He's talking about whatever is on earth is already done in heaven. Now we get too deep. And so whenever the clouds are there, it's God trying to show those who are on earth <laughs> what's possible. That the future we seek is already sealed in heaven. I'm not, listen. He's trying to show us that something that is going on in heaven is activating a moment that's getting ready to happen in your future. And so what I have to do is show you a little glimpse, get you a little close to the firmament of heaven to show you that what you're going through is small and finite. This moment requires a greatness of you, but do not be dismayed. The end result, I will show you a glimpse of it that as on earth already in heaven, I want to show you a victory, in other words, a little glimpse of it. You cannot go there with me right now, but I can get you close to understanding just a small inkling of what glory and victory really look like. Enough to inspire you towards your greatness. So Jesus is in a moment where the clouds are before him. And the Bible is showing us and demonstrating to us that big brothers show up. Elias, Elijah, and Moses show up in the firmament of heaven. Yeah. The Bible gives no indication of what happens, what goes on in the cloud. Doesn't show and demonstrate. All we know is that Peter, James, and John are in the separation where only Jesus can go through into the cloud and communicate with Elias and with Moses. We can only imagine and extrapolate what they're talking about. The conversation that's going on, that as on earth is in heaven, what they're talking about to say, Jesus, they persecuted me too. They see Moses saying, oh man, the people, they wouldn't listen. Oh man, when I came down with the tablets, the very word of God, they had idols of gold. They're knuckleheads and hard-headed too. When my greatness pulled on them, and manna came from heaven when I parted the Red Sea on behalf of God. They still talked bad about me. They still were stubborn and wanted to go back. But if he can do it for me, Jesus, he can do it for you. Because as on earth, as in heaven, that if they did it for me, they can do it for you. The heavenly clouds are set up as a witness to you that you don't have to be dismayed in your moment of greatness. Somebody's going to catch this. There's a cloud that God shows that even when Elijah cried about Elijah leaving him, he said that the chariots of heaven are coming. He said, don't be sad. As on earth, 
the reward from where you are, but I'm here to bring the cloud close enough that you can see like closed caption television that God's got more in store, that you are not really alone, and that he covers you in your greatness. Greatness. That in Hebrews 12 and 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about yeah. with such great, say great, great, a cloud of witnesses. Yeah. And let us do what with that? It's nice to see the glory. Yeah. Most of us like to uh, bask in the glory. We like to be around great people. Mm -hmm. And we bask in it. We get on social media and say, oh, I was just at this concert, I was just around this person. People like to photobomb in the background, somebody at, at a restaurant, and they're great, and you'll be like, in the picture life. <laughs> huh? We like to be around greatness. But what's the use of the cloud? Is it just so you can be around greatness? To be near the cloud? To be close to heavenly things? To see what's part of that all it is? It's just a vision of the future? Is that really the purpose? That we find out in Hebrews 12 and 1 that we are surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses. Okay, that's great, Paul, but for what? To let us lay aside every weight. In other words, stop worrying. The witness is to show you not to worry. Moses and Elijah say, Jesus, be encouraged. Don't worry. Set aside the weight. We've been there. We know the outcome. It hurts when you're going through it to stay, be great and stay great. It's not easy. But I'm here to tell you, set aside every weight. Now what's a weight? A weight is two things. There is the, oh my, there is the weight of the things you worry about. Your concerns. Things that you cannot control. You need to stop worrying about them in your greatness. In other words, I'm in a doctoral program right now. Some of us are in school right now. Right now in school. But we got other responsibilities. We got to go to work. We got to feed folks. We got to clothe people. We got to wash clothes and dishes. We got to deal with the broken washing machine in the basement. But your schoolwork is your ex deserves your excellence. It is a type of greatness that's in you. And the other things are good to do. They're part of your goodness, but you can't keep your eye and your mind off of the greatness. And so you'll worry if you're not careful about can I keep up with my study groups? Can I read all these all these books and articles? When in fact, I'm really trained to do good stuff. If I'm really honest with myself, I prefer to wash dishes. It's transactional. And when I'm done, I get a, a reward, a type of gratification. I can sit on my couch and eat a Snickers bar or some Larna Dunes and feel accomplished in life. But something about greatness, you cannot see and feel the same way you do about doing dishes and washing clothes. It requires a type of connection to something that you cannot see because eyes have not seen and ears have not heard that which God has in store for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Set aside every weight. Stop worrying about what you cannot control. Greatness is not trans. Sectional. You will not be able to worry about how you're going to get to school and go to school and be successful in school if in fact, really what God is calling you to do is take life in chunks. Do the work he has in front of you today. Let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. And far as the past, let the dead bury the dead. Or you will never be able to be available to God for greatness. Set aside every way. And the sin. Uh-oh. And the sin. 
So part of the weight is worry and concern. But the other part is sin. Uh-oh. In other words, there's some stuff in your life, if you're not careful, that's keeping you from greatness. David, as much as he was a man after God's own heart, his sin prohibited him from building the temple. He had too much blood on his hands. There's something God is calling you to do with your greatness. That is not just your worry about getting it done that's going to mess you up. It's actually the sin that's in your in your life. Set aside every weight. Including the sin. And the sin which does so easily beset us. Keeps you from being great. Your sin is not just hovering in the area of your goodness. It's not just messing up your character. Let's be honest about it. There's some stuff that nobody see. They don't really see it. They don't really know you really suffer with it. And when they look at you, they see what they see. Whatever it is. And many of us are masters of illusion. Huh? They don't really see. That's not what's keeping you. Huh? Your, look. Your sin is not keeping you all the time from being who you are to other people. It's keeping you from being who you are to God. And being available toward your destiny. In other words, you can run and hide from people. But you can't run and hide from God. There is an accountability for your greatness that goes beyond what people can see. Stop measuring your greatness by what people can see about you. That is a low level of expectation for your life. That if they catch me, see it, or know about it, it becomes important. A lot of us will... Dress up, we're the masters of dressing up. We know how to match colors and clothes and textures, hair and nails and smiles. We got whitening creams and lotions and exfoliators. And people are so used to seeing something that looks excellent. And God only knows you are disqualifying yourself from the kingdom and the work of God. The sin that so easily besets us, comma, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The race that is set before us. We are not allowing ourselves to truly activate our excellence for greatness. When we don't understand the urgency, this is a race. This is actually a race. This life. It's a race. There is no fire that you don't see a firefighter trying to get to urgently. You cannot take their time. You cannot take your time to respond to someone who is in their home trapped in a fire or is dying and needs to get to the, to the hospital. Emergencies in life. It's, it's two things. What is The thing that is driving you isn't always urgent. You have to learn how to discern between the thing that is important and the thing that is urgent. Your greatness requires discernment. Because you are running a race, you do not have time to waste. Jesus decided to go up on the mountain. He decided to. In the middle of all that was going on, he made a deposit into his own greatness. I may not need this. This may not be a fire going on right now. But James Baldwin has a book called The Fire Next Time. It talks about the lynchings that will happen. The crosses that will be burned. The lynchings that will happen. Being prepared for the fire next time. Some of us are so immediate. Living in the immediacy of life. We don't know how to take time to invest in our own greatness. The sin that so easily besets us in life. There are three things that we need to do to access our greatness that we have to understand. Number one, greatness must be modeled. 
Stop trying to be great looking at YouTube and reading self-help books. If you don't have great people around you, you will not be able to access your own greatness. Greatness must be pulled out of you. It must be pulled out of you. Someone has to have enough proximity to your life, not to just see you, but to actually know you. Or else they won't be able to say, didn't you promise yourself this time this month that you was gonna lose 10 pounds? Didn't you promise yourself last year this time that you was gonna be finished school? What happened? Some of us, it's the day to day, somebody has to call us sometimes to wake us up because we was out working, driving Uber or whatever it was, trying to do other things that's good for us to do. But now, did you invest in the great, are you too bogged down in your day-to-day -day good stuff that you, you bought your bus tickets, you paid your bills, but I'm trying to remind you of the long-term thing that you got to do for the fire that's coming next time. Not just for you, but the folks that are connected and depending on you. We have to realize that the first thing to access our greatness, that greatness must be modeled in us. Listen, listen, listen. If you don't model greatness, if you're not living your life around folks, Jesus is not the sum total of just his teaching. Read the Bible to understand how he moved, the way he connected with people and gave them access to his life. Greatness must be modeled. Yeah. The things that I do, you shall do, and greater. How, gee, they, looked, they were perplexed. Like, how? If you were watching me all along, you would know. How are you watching and modeling greatness? Greatness must be modeled. Now listen, a lot of us are modeling people that we favor. The people who brought the greatness out of me, I really didn't like them much. To be honest with you, I, wasn't, I would never hang out with them. Come on, let's be honest. I would never hang out at TGI Friday and eat the, 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 the ribs and chicken combo huh, with the honey barbecue and sit and talk about life with. I would not. They're just not that appealing to me around hanging out with food, folks, and fun. It's just not that way. Yeah. But when I talk about helping me create a spreadsheet to organize my finances, to help me with my leadership qualities, that I might be able to be a more effective communicator, working on my empathy, and my ability to understand my own emotions and the emotions of others. That came from being put in scenarios and situations by folks that were willing to see where my shoes were untied and where my tie had a turn my crooked knot in it and being willing to die and cross tees and go in the cobweb areas of my character and dust off the book of my life and review the areas that I have a wrongly created self-concept and start fixing those broken spaces and those areas of excuse that I've created for myself because I may have come out of a certain broke situation and I came out of a broken marriage and I didn't have a best friend and my mother was hard on me but I still make all of these excuses having someone situated in my life having Jesus as the well when he goes to Samaria on top of the well reading the woman on her stuff, telling her, I already see you. I run into folks like you every day. And you got a choice to make about what's possible for your future. You have no excuse now. You come for regular water and you got living water. So what's the excuse now? I'm staring you right in your face, telling you that water's gonna feed you for about one day. But I've got something for you that might just quench your thirst forever. Can you model good character to lead you towards greatness? Second thing, I'm almost done, is that greatness takes walking alone. Greatness takes walk. Sometimes in your greatness you have to walk with people. And sometimes you have to walk by yourself. Now the walking by yourself, let me tell you, be honest with you about it. The walking by yourself is actually walking ahead of people. Wow. Yeah. 
It's not really walking alone. It's really walking ahead of people. Jesus said, a little while and I won't be with you. But in a little while, you shall see me again. You will. But right now, i got to walk ahead of you. For in my Father's house are many mansions. There are many mansions. i, I got to go before you. Huh? There goes a little, the, the, the things you, I do, you do, will do in bed, and you will do in greater. Peter, feed my flock. Uh, but I have to go now. I gotta walk ahead of you now. I actually have to go get encouraged by Elisha and Moses, who've been where I'm going. I'm getting ready to go to the cross. And therefore, you've seen enough of me at this level. You've got enough of me. And it's time to go forward because there's nothing else I can impart to you at this level. You've seen everything that I have to offer here. You've been in my kitchen, you ate my good cooking. You sat at my dining room table. We played cards and dominoes. You hung out with me. We cried and we laughed together. Now where I am going requires something different of me and you. And if I don't leave you, Lot says Abram, we're going to stand here in the wilderness forever. I must go east into the mountains. If you ever need me, you have my number, Lot. Call me. I'm available. We will always be connected. But there's an urgency if I don't go. You will keep us here and our greatness will die here in the desert. I have to go in front of you. i got to go before you. And I know it feels like I'm an astronaut, a cosmonaut in this space station by myself. There's a, did you hear the story right now? There are astronauts trapped on the International Space Station. They said it would be weeks. Now what they say, seven months, they're up there. They're up there seven months. But here's the interesting thing. It says that while they're still up there, they're not up there crying and complaining. And they're doing research. <laughs> that whoever comes next after them will have the benefit of all of the data that's available. Now you get a chance to see it as being trapped in outer space or being a forebearer, a forerunner, or pioneer for those who are coming after you. Yeah. It's all about your perspective of what it is. Either you are alone or you're going before people. It's up to you how you see it. It's up to you, it's up to you to see your life as a lonely, sad, love star. Or you can say, God is preparing me for places and spaces where nobody's gone before. And he's given me at least a cloud of witnesses, of folks who have been there and who have done greatness. I got a blueprint. And I'm not going to leave here until I get every little thing that I'm supposed to be taught. I'm not going to miss it. And I know it's taught to me ugly. Some folks didn't have time. But I fit it in, I fit it in to my life and to my schedule. And between all my doing clothes and washing clothes and, and doing dishes and bills, I fit time in for the cloud. Yeah. How many of you would take time to just sit in the cloud with the witnesses? Because they're not going to be with you forever. A little while they're with you and a little while and they won't. They go before us to prepare a place. Where are you in your process? Do you see what you really have? Are you just eating that sweet potato pie on Christmas? Or are you asking for the recipe? It's the difference between being a consumer and a producer in life. Where are you? Where are you, greatness? It must be pulled out of you, number one. Number two, you sometimes must walk, walk alone which is a reflection actually of walking before people. And the third thing, and I'm on my way to my seat, is that greatness is never controlled. It's only passed on. Yeah. It's never held long. It's only passed on. Hmm. You only have it for a little while. What are you going to do with your greatness? Every track runner, every gymnast, every swimmer has a time on their ability. 
You might have one or two Olympics in you. You just might. And that's if you train well and stay healthy. For wanting it, that's not enough. That's not enough. That we, we all got dreams. <laughs> and at some point, you get to a level where everybody actually works hard. And then you just have to be blessed enough to stay healthy. And you might get one or two, depending on the sport. Now, maybe with the, the marksmanship, you can do that to your six, however long till you got eyes or whatever. But the swimming and the gymnastics and boxing, you might have one good Olympics in you. Greatness does not show up or is not with you forever. It's meant to be passed on. Who are you investing in? As you receive greatness, who are you passing it to? A lot of us want to be the only one. We get tired when other black folks show up at the job with a manager's, a manager's title. We get upset we're like, what is she doing? What is she doing here? What is Latifa doing here? She only has an associate's degree and I have a bachelor's degree. You don't know who Latifa was listening to for the last five years. The people she's been under, the cloud that she's been witness to, she might just pass you on her way to greatness, not because God favors anybody, but because excellence and the principles of greatness follow those who actually activate them. Jesus said first to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Whoever so wants to come, if you want it, it doesn't matter at some point. But my own people get the chance to get it first. But it doesn't, doesn't guarantee that you're going to get it. You actually have to want it bad enough. It is not controlled. Greatness is not something that's controlled. In other words, what God places in you is perfectly created for you to not just utilize and access for yourself, but to actually demonstrate in someone else's life. Are you taking time to disciple people? Are you rushing folks through your life, only giving them access to the fun, to the part of you that creates, can catch a good vibe? What are you giving people access to? If somebody taught you the way to be excellent and great, and it required dullness and repetition, why are you trying to be so cool to everybody else? That's not how you learn greatness. You didn't get it from being the cool guy, from being popular with everybody. You got it in the dungeons of life, doing push-ups and sit-ups, learning to do the stuff that nobody else would do. So why would you be raised by grandma and mom who made you do your homework and your chores on a weekday, but yet you let your children play PlayStation all night and hang out and smoke weed in the backyard? You are not passing on greatness. And so we get into this place in life where we want to make life easier for folks. And that's not how greatness gets passed on. There's a formula. We are so afraid of folks presenting us their fragility. We don't know how to deal with folks when they push back and tell us that life is just, that's just a little too much. I can't do that. We don't know how to witness in the cloud, in other words, to folks. When you go before people, don't compromise what it takes to pull them forward. Be honest about what it is to succeed in the body of Christ. You are going to come under attack in weird and strange ways that don't make sense. I got this relationship with the enemy where he had, he's been attacking me at night since I was four years old. <laughs> I can't even explain it to people. What it's like. But from all of my youth and my childhood, all I could do is just cry and scream and wet the bed. But when I learned how to be grounded in the scriptures, I can face those demons at night and say, Satan, get behind me. And I still might not tell it to everybody, but it's the second time in my life I've told it to anybody in this pulpit today. But I learned how to wake 
up from that torture knowing it's only because the devil knows my destiny. And he's known it since I was a little boy. And he would rather try to intimidate me, scare me, confuse me, get me off track, think I'm worthless, that I'm useless, that I'm a nobody, that I'm washed up before I even get started. And your job is to never concede to the push and the manipulation of the enemy, no matter how it comes. It might not always come as demons in the night. Sometimes it will come as your best friend who can't stand that you're passing them, that you got to go before them. It's not always demons in the dark. Sometimes it's folks really close to you that will feed you till you get fat and useless, that will love on you until you get complacent, that will poke on you with jokes, and the truth of it that's under it is emotional abuse. Come on. We got to be honest about what's stifling our greatness. Pass your greatness on. All of that trauma, folks, is confusing us about the purpose of the cloud. It's not going to be with you long. You're not going to have folks with you long. The spirit will not tarry always. You are going to have to make some decisions about the fire next time. Are you putting it off to another generation? Deuteronomy says there rose a generation that did not know God, nor the things that God did for the previous generation. So they served Baal and Beelzebub. Huh? This is what happened. The witness was lost. It's not just that folks wouldn't listen, but the witnesses stopped pushing. Don't lose your push, people. Doesn't matter what feels more popular than your voice, stronger than your voice, bells and whistles, sequins, gold and silver. Gold and silver, I have none. I don't have money. I can't pay everybody's bills. That's why you're with me. I'm sorry. I can't, I got enough people on the payroll today. Silver and gold. James and John and Peter got it. That when they approached the man with his complaints about what he could not do, they got it on that mountain. They got it. They figured it out. I'm there as an example. I can inspire you towards something I'm doing. I can show you better than I can tell you. Silver and gold, I have none. But that which I do have, I give freely. You listen, if you don't rise and take your bed, it's not because I didn't warn you or didn't tell you that it was possible to go on two legs, that you didn't have to hop and hobble into your future. You actually don't have to smoke your way into being anxiety free. There's another way to approach life that's not toxic and temporary. But you must take your bed, rise, and walk. You cannot be excellent and great hobbling through life asking for someone to give you the thing that you can give yourself. Stand on your feet. A little while. You shall not see me. I gotta go. A little while you will not see me. Just a little while. Stop thinking people can't handle you going forward. You gotta go forward. You gotta move forward. Don't let yourself be pigeonholed in your past. God's got greatness. And your greatness must guide you.